Unit 4.3 is data representation, and just a bit of a warning up front for this. Although there aren't that many new things in the A2 syllabus objectives, the syllabus is full of a recap of everything that you did at AS. That's all of it. Every single thing you did for data representation in AS is asked again here and in more detail. Go and take a look at your past paper stuff. Go and take a look at your old resources because this playlist will not be recapping all of that content. That's a huge amount of stuff to learn from basic principles. But of course, we will be using those in the activities and in the past paper questions at the end. Here's just an example of the list of objectives that you need to recap in terms of the, the AS content. And there's a lot of it there, from applying a binary arithmetic techniques to explaining the representation of positive and negative integers, blah de blah de blah There's a lot on there that you've done at AS that you'd be reusing here. And of course, you'd be expected to use them in a more complex context. As for the list of basic understanding you should have, and you can Google this stuff or go into my resources if you want a bit more information, but you want to convert from binary to decimal or decimal to binary. Now, of course, another term for decimal is the denary number system, which is the term that I prefer, so please excuse me if I drop in and out of using decimal and denary. Uh, then we've got hexadecimal to decimal, decimal to hex, binary to hex, hex to binary, and binary addition and subtraction. That's just a list of the very basic things you need to know. Following on from that, sine and magnitude versus two complement is two different ways for us to store a signed value in binary. You remember the left-hand side is where we have sine and magnitude, and the leftmost or most significant bit is given over to represent the negative indicator. Now that's fine, but it accidentally allows us to represent both plus zero and minus zero. So it actually gives us less of a range. Two's complement is a beautiful number system where the leftmost bit is just the negative version of itself. So that only gives us one zero and the full range of numbers. Now there is a method here to convert uh, unsigned binary values into two's complement by flipping a bunch of bits. I don't particularly like that method because it is just a method. I prefer just to know what the structure is, and that's the leftmost value is the minus version of itself, and you have to use that in the construction of the value overall. Floating point form then, you remember, involves a mantissa and an exponent of a set size. It's a normalized representation of data, which means it very much looks like naught point something or one point something, and usually, the exponent explains how the point moves to give us the correct value, either to the left or to the right. Now we need to be able to convert from floating point form to standard decimal representation and back the other way as well. The question will identify the size of the mantissa and exponent and identify how both elements are signed, whether they are sine and magnitude or two's complement. The main thing to remember about mantissa and exponent and the entire floating point form is that if we give the mantissa more bits, we get more accuracy. And if we give the exponent more bits, we get a larger range. And the idea is this value would be stored in one memory space. Truncation and rounding are two different methods for simplifying a float number into an integer. Truncation is where we simply remove the decimal and rounding is where we find the closest whole number to that decimal. So in this example, 36.6 .6 truncates to 36, but rounds to 37 because it is closer to 37. Rounding is computationally more expensive, it takes longer to do, but it does give us data that is closer in accuracy to the original data. Now, truncation itself is really, really simple, very easy to do computationally, but can at times give results that are further away in accuracy to the original data. In deciding which one is more useful for your purpose, you need to make a decision about whether accuracy is more important or computational speed. The first main A2 objective that we need to cover is explaining the use of shift functions, logical and arithmetic, and interpret and apply the shifts in algorithms and programs. And this is reasonably straightforward. A logical shift is where we move each binary bit to the right or to the left, depending upon what it tells us by that many bits, and we replace any empty bits with zero. In this example, if we're doing a left logical shift by three, we move the entire set of binary bits three places to the left, and as they move, they drop off. You'll see then on the right-hand side, we have three blank spaces, which are filled with zeros. Arithmetic shifts then are slightly different. 
A left shift works in exactly the same way, but a right shift, instead of filling the blanks with the zeros, we fill the blanks with whatever the leftmost bit is. So in this example, where we do a right arithmetic shift by four, I'm going to move all of those binary bits four places to the right and fill the gaps with whatever the leftmost bit is. So in this case, the leftmost bit is one. Let's move it four places to the right, filling it each time with whatever was in the left-hand place. And of course, any that have gone over the size of the uh, bit spaces we have disappear, and we're left with this value. Now what's the point? Well, arithmetic shifts to the right divide by two each time it shifts, and shifts to the left multiply by two each time it shifts. They're very, very straightforward methods of doing multiplications and divisions in powers of two. Final objective for A2 is describe the cause of overflow and underflow. Now these are things we've talked about before. Overflow is the most common because it was part of binary addition, and hopefully you'll remember that overflow happens when the number that we need to store, the result of, say, an addition, is too large to fit into the available amount of bits that we've got. What happens in this example is that we would lose the overflowed value. We would lose the most significant value in the one, and our answer would be just plain wrong, so completely incorrect. Now, we can get to overflow by shifting or binary addition. Underflow is where a shift results in a number that needs more bits than is available to represent it, but in this case, it's to the right. It's where we have a number that is so small or so fractional that it's very, very difficult to represent that in the amount of bits we've got available. So let's imagine that in this example, we do a right arithmetic shift by two. That means we push everything down to the right by two, and we replace what's missing on the left-hand side with whatever was on the leftmost point of the original bit pattern. So that's going to be zeros this time. All we're able to store now is zero, despite the fact that off onto the right hand side there somewhere should really be a one and a zero. So we've gone from being able to represent a fractional amount to representing zero. We lose the actual information that is worthwhile or meaningful in this example of underflow.